Welcome to Charting New Paths in Pre-K through 12 Education, a podcast by Solution Tree. In our author segment, we invite our new and best-selling authors published by Solution Tree to share their experience and valuable insights with you. Listen to this segment and add another tool in your toolbox of research-affirmed classroom-ready strategies to improve student outcomes. I'm your host, Prisma Lopez Marine. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. In today's episode, the book we'll be talking about is titled The Complete Guide to Blended Learning, Activating Agency, Differentiation, Community and Inquiry for Students. This book serves as an essential guide where you can learn how to weave together online and offline learning to shift students to the center of the learning experience. We are joined by the author of this book, Dr. Catlin Tucker. She is a best-selling author, a keynote speaker, international trainer, and professor in the Master's of Arts in Teaching program at Pepperdine University in California. She taught for 16 years in Sonoma County, California, where she was named Teacher of the Year in 2010. She also has written several books on blended learning, including Blended Learning in Grades 4 through 12, Blended Learning in Action, Power Up Blended Learning, Balance with Blended Learning, and UDL and Blended Learning Thriving in Flexible Learning Landscapes. In addition to authoring books, she also writes an internationally ranked blog and hosts a podcast called The Balance. She earned her bachelor's degree in English literature from the University of California, Los Angeles. Also, she earned her English credential and master's degree in education at the University of California, Santa Barbara. In 2020, Dr. Tucker earned her doctorate in learning technologies at Pepperdine University, researching teacher engagement in blended learning environments. Dr. Catlin Tucker, we are so excited to have you here with us. Thank you for joining me for this episode. Absolutely. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, now let's go ahead and get uh, to know you a bit more. So can you share with us about your current role in education? Currently, I am working as a blended learning coach, so I typically go into schools for X number of days and get to work directly with teachers designing and facilitating blended lessons, usually with whoever the coaches that like live in that district, kind of shadowing the experience so they can take over when I'm not there. I am also teaching in the um, Master's in the Arts of Teaching program at Pepperdine, so teachers who are in the process of getting into classrooms, which is really exciting. And I love that work. And I do a lot of traveling to train teachers all over the world around the shift to blended learning. Wow. So where have you traveled to worldwide? Oh, I mean, it's everything's been on pause for a couple of years now, but I have been to Africa a few times. I've worked in South America. Um, I've done some virtual stuff with South Korea. So lots of um, lots of different folks. And then now that things are opening back up, I actually leave for Panama in just a few days and then go to South Africa and Dubai. So definitely a lot of travel coming up for me, which is exciting. Absolutely. And in um, the best weather to where you can get away. <laughs> well, you are in <laughs> California, so it's not like snowing like it is here um, in Indiana, but still you, you get to have the great experience. And then also people get to experience your um, teaching from all that aspect as well. So tell us more about your pre previous teaching experience in K through 12 in California. Yeah, so I spent 16 years in English language arts classrooms teaching at the high school level, primarily ninth and 10th grade. They were my favorite, although I've taught ninth through 12th grade English language arts. I also have my career technical education credential in kind of a technology, information technology space. So also got to teach some classes related to social media, um, very much project based, um, blended learning grounded. So, um, yeah, I loved, I loved high school students. It was very fun getting to work with them at the start of my career for sure. So from your experience and research, how would you describe the significance and fundamental uh, presence of using technology in today's education, uh, with the new generations of students? Yeah. I mean, I, Technology is permeating all of these aspects of our lives. So it's going to have 
So it's going to play some role in the classroom. I think it's really exciting to decide what that looks like. And what I hope to avoid is simply using technology to isolate learners and instead really be thoughtful about how are we using technology to connect learners, to give them more control over their learning experience. Um, and really my why, like what is the value of this has evolved definitely as my role in education has shifted, right? So when I was a teacher, I was like, gosh, I just want kids to engage. <laughs> I want them to be excited to be here because they're enjoying the process of learning. And for the first five, six years of my career, that was not happening. So at my early stages, it was very much like, hey, I want to find ways to engage learners in these dynamic kind of learning experiences. And as I've kind of done work as a coach and then a doctoral student and now a professor working with my own graduate students, my why has definitely shifted. So for me, part of what was really hard to watch during the pandemic was teachers were not prepared to teach online. They were kind of thrown into this unfamiliar teaching and learning landscape. And they realized that that whole group teacher led approach didn't translate very well on Zoom, right? It, when you're not in that physical classroom with students, students would just turn off their camera, they walk away from their computers. And so what I see is this opportunity to arm teachers with a mindset, a skill set, and a tool set that is really flexible enough to work entirely in a physical classroom, entirely online, or this kind of blend of the two in hybrid kind of programs. And so I think blended learning provides that flexibility. We can use these models exclusively in a classroom and they work wonderfully. Um, what was really exciting from my perspective as a blended learning expert was just to see how well they also worked when kids were working remotely. So the offline learning components, that might be students taking a break from the computer to interview a family member or a grandparent about something. It might be going out into their outside environment to make observations and collect field work. So watching teachers even run like virtual station rotations, for me, it was just this validating moment of these models are flexible enough that if we can get teachers comfortable designing and facilitating learning with them, it won't matter whether they're in an, a classroom online or a blend of the two, they're going to have a skill set and tool set that is flexible enough where they can feel confident teaching in any of these learning landscapes with, you know, hopefully with a lot of confidence and, and knowing that they can help move all learners toward these firm standard aligned goals. Right. Now you mentioned, I liked what you just said, arm teachers. That's very powerful. I'm very true. It's a very necessary thing to do, um, especially with a lot of changes that is going on in education um, because of the pandemic and even after trying to live in that after pandemic, even though there's still that issue, but um, living after that. Uh, so you did mention that you're also an educator for higher ed. How can this apply towards that? I know we're, edu we're dedicated to K through 12, but I feel like some of this work in your book can also apply to the way um, higher education students can learn. Well, I'm a big believer that you need to use the models in your practice as a professor, as a trainer and facilitator that you want the people you're working with to use. So for example, when I had my first in-person class last semester with my students, they were going through a station rotation, right? They were in the class and a lot of them hadn't been in a station rotation maybe ever, but it was my way of demonstrating through modeling the value of this small group kind of rotation where I was working to customize my teacher led time for the students sitting in front of me. Um, maybe that's, I was grouping them by their subject area or by a particular need that they had. And then in the other stations, allowing them the agency to decide, do I wanna work on my own? Do I wanna work with a partner? Do I wanna do this online? Do I wanna do this offline? So for me in, in higher ed, if we want teachers coming out of higher ed prepared to use these models in their practice when they get into elementary, middle school, high school classes, they have to have had experience with them in higher ed. They have to like get comfortable and, and start to feel and appreciate the value as a student so that when they start to design for their future students or their, you know, their students, when they get into classrooms, they're prepared to use these models as well. That makes sense. 
Um, now let's get into your book here. So the complete guide to blended learning. Uh, can you explain the COI the- uh, theoretical framework? Yeah, the community of inquiry theoretical framework really does ground the book and give it its structure. I always tell a teacher, I'm not here to like bore you with theoretical frameworks. I know that's not why a teacher picks up a book like that, but it does organize, create this organizational structure for the book. And most of the research on blended and online learning is grounded in the community of inquiry framework. And so really it's this kind of interplay between these three presences, the teaching presence, the social presence, the cognitive presence. So in the book, I have a chunk of it dedicated to really unpacking what is the teaching presence? What are our primary roles in a blended learning environment, right? We're expert slash instructor, we're facilitator, we're designer of learning experiences. And so getting into each of those different roles and what they look like in a blended learning environment, what we need to be considering as we design and architect learning experiences for students. Um, How can we maybe free ourselves from the front of the room so we're not trapped there in that expert instructor role for huge chunks of time, but instead have more opportunities to sit alongside learners in our facilitator role, really supporting their individual progress toward you know, learning objectives and goals. And so that's one section. And then I get into the social presence and how do we help students to feel comfortable projecting their social and emotional selves in their face-to-face interactions and their online interactions. So really tapping into social, emotional learning and skill building and how we can leverage that to really develop a robust community of learners. And then the cognitive presence and how how can we think about leveraging inquiry to kind of capitalize on student curiosity? Because too often students are given answers to questions they didn't ask and solutions to problems they've never encountered. And so how are we thinking about positioning them to drive inquiry cycles that really target things they're curious about and that they they want to learn more about? So the first one you mentioned where I didn't even think about that where the teacher um, can move themselves from the instructional role, but then also work alongside the student. Is that to empower the student and not feel so instruction-based? Well, I think the reality is there's things that technology does really, really well. And there's things that people, humans do very, very well, and they're different, right? So what technology does really well is transfer information. You can watch a video, you can listen to a podcast, you can go to an interactive website, you can read an article and acquire information. And when a student is able to control the pace at which they move through that information, they're they're more likely to understand that information being presented. Whereas when a teacher is at the front of the room, transferring information, it's the teacher pacing. And there's a lot of potential barriers that exist between, you know, what the teacher is saying and the student being able to take it in, right? They might have auditory processing challenges. They might have attention challenges. They might be distracted and not feeling well. They might not have the vocabulary or background knowledge or um, prior knowledge to really understand what's being presented. Whereas when students are watching a video, they can pause it. They can look up a word. They can rewind it. They can slow it down. They get on closed captionings. Um, there's lots of ways in which they can adjust that experience to make it more effective. So then if we don't need to spend huge chunks of time transferring information because technology does that really well, and P.S., some kids are going to really love watching a video. Others might prefer a podcast or an article. So even just giving them pathways to choose how do I want to acquire this information? What's going to work best for me as a learner? Should I partner with somebody in this class and go through this information together because that would be helpful? Or do I want to do it on my own? And giving students that flexibility is key. Then it's like, well, what do humans do really well? Well, we listen, we observe, we respond organically to other humans' needs. And so if teachers are going to maximize their, what they do really well, it's about creating the time to 
lead small group instruction, responding to their specific needs, like their specific questions, using models and text examples at different levels so that different students can access that information. It's carving out time for real-time feedback sessions where we're giving focused, actionable feedback as students work. It's conferencing. It's it's that human side of teaching that we want to make more time for because ultimately that's how we build relationships with learners. And that's how learners feel seen and supported in a classroom. They don't feel seen and supported when we just stand at the front of the room talking at them and then assign a worksheet. They're going to feel seen and supported when we're sitting alongside, asking questions, engaging in conversations, providing appropriate scaffolds and supports. So in this book, you also focus on the bridge between online and in-person learning. Um, the rise for uh, this learning was crucial during the COVID-19 pandemic, as we talked about. What has been the impact on teachers and students? Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I do know that blended learning as a phrase gained a lot of like recognition and it was that phrase was thrown around a lot during the pandemic. But my first book on blended learning, it was published in like 2011. So this is not like a reaction to a moment. It's just a better way to design and facilitate learning. And I think that's really something to emphasize. Um, yet, I think the pandemic was so challenging and a lot of teachers were so frustrated and disillusioned and exhausted that there's sometimes this like negative perception of technology and of blended learning because they associate it with this really challenging time in their career, which makes total sense. But what I think the the thing that as we come out of kind of the, the pandemic or we're coming out the other side of the real intense part of the pandemic, it's really just recognizing that blended learning has value for teachers and for learners that transcends any particular moment, right? So I think one benefit of the pandemic is we do have more kids with access to devices. We have more students who are connected to Wi-Fi networks, and that's a benefit. Um, I think we also have, you know, teachers who are struggling a little with hey, I tried this during the pandemic, but now we're back in classroom. So I really don't know what to carry over and what to kind of leave in the past. And so when I work with teachers, I'm like, let's just be really clear. Learner variability is the norm in classrooms, right? We are teaching such diverse groups of learners who have different skills and different needs, different language proficiencies and learning preferences. Why on earth would we ever design a single one size fits all experience for such a diverse group of learners with all of these different needs and preferences? Instead, what I want teachers to recognize is during the pandemic, it was hard, it was exhausting, but their skill set grew. They developed new skills, more confidence likely with technology, even if they don't love technology. Um, and so don't lose that pull that into your work and continue to build on it to really think about if I have such a diverse group of learners and learner variability is just the norm, how am I designing learning experiences, leveraging this tech and these skills that I have walked away from the pandemic with to make sure I'm really meeting learners where they're at. I'm giving them a higher degree of agency and meaningful choice in the learning experience. I'm differentiating kind of more consistently and effectively. And I'm thinking intentionally about what aspects of this lesson would work better if students had a high degree of control over the pace at which they consume information or the pace at which they navigate a complex multi-step task. So it's about like that intentionality and kind of bringing it into this post-pandemic reality, um, building on the skill set that we've kind of cultivated as we navigated that online learning moment. Being able to empower students that way could even, I mean, speculating here, but could even lower, you know, dropping out from school because you are giving this opportunity to learn the way that you can because everybody mm -hmm. learns differently. Everybody hopefully, hopefully that would be that would be the outcome of going through something like this with this book. Um, so now, um, chapter four talks about the educator's role. How does this book guide educators towards designing effective learning experiences? 
So I get into the rotation model. So we talk about station rotation model, whole group rotation, playlist model or individual rotation, and the flipped classroom model. And really the goal is to help teachers develop this kind of robust tool belt full of models. I think so often when I work with teachers, they're either exclusively or primarily using that teacher-led whole group teacher-paced model and it treating it almost like the Swiss army knife of instructional models, right? Like that it can serve to accomplish every outcome and meet every need. And that's just not reality, right? Like there are times when maybe you use that model, fine. But when we start to really get intentional about what is the learning objective, what are the needs of my students in this class? How would I, as the teacher, like to use my time to really support individual and small groups of learners? Then it's helpful to have multiple models to pull from, to be like, this is actually the best model to accomplish these outcomes and to meet these students' needs and to free me to spend my time in class doing something that's really going to help support all learners in making progress. And so that's what I want. I want them to understand what the models are. So I go into that. When might they want to use them? So for example, are you frustrated by large class sizes? Are you not in a one-to-one? Like which model is even available to you to use in this particular moment? Um, And then also I talk about those kind of overarching ideas of student agency, differentiation and control over time and pace in relation to each of the different models. And I even have like tips for making this model work smoothly out of the gate. Like when we try new things as teachers, especially those of us who have been in this profession for a very long time, it's easy to get quickly disillusioned when things don't go perfectly the first time. But we have to see ourselves as the lead learner in a classroom, right? We need to be experimenting. We need to be trying new things. We need to know sometimes we're going to fail and it's not going to go well. And actually, if we're willing to be vulnerable in that way and honest with students, like, hey, I've never done this before. We're going to try it out and then we're going to talk about it and see what adjustments might we make to improve this experience before we do it again. Then all of a sudden, it's a lot less scary for learners to take risks, for learners to be vulnerable in our classroom. So for me, I really want teachers confident that they understand the models, how to design for them, um, what their role in each model could look like um, so that they have that that really robust tool belt that they can use for the duration of their career, whether they're in person, online, or kind of this blend of the two. Wow. I like that. That's very good. Um, So there is a note in the book, which I was very, um, it was towards the beginning, but I thought this was, um, I didn't even think about that. This is something that teachers would think of. It says, if you were scared that technology will replace you, you can put that worry aside. It won't. Technology cannot replace the human side of the work uh, we do as teachers. And that is where our actual value lies. Uh, Can you elaborate on what you meant by this uh, regarding human connection? Yeah. And so I think that's really about the conversation of like, let's let tech do what it does well. Let's let it transfer some of that information, free us from the front of the room so we can spend our time connecting with learners and doing that human side of this work that technology is not good at. Um, Really seeing our work with students as this partnership. And that's ultimately what I want for teachers is to see students as capable partners and to create the time and space in these classrooms to connect with them on a human level. What was fascinating in my own research around teacher engagement in blended learning environments was that when teachers were asked about their relationships with learners, teachers who taught blended learning courses or courses with a blended learning format versus traditional courses almost unanimously said, I feel closer to the students in my blended courses because of our small group and one-on-one interactions. Like we're actually connecting on that human level and it is strengthening that relationship. And ultimately that's really engaging for teachers when they feel they have that connection. It's just hard to do that when we're feeling kind of trapped at the room talking, orchestrating the parts of a lesson, um, it's much easier to do if we're partnering with learners, allowing them to drive their learning and then creating the space to connect with them. The book also talks about using SEL skills to build community. So after a tough couple of years, educators have dealt with so many changes. How can these uh, SEL skills be put into motion? 
Yeah. So I couch that conversation under the social presence. So again, that's the student's ability to project their social and emotional selves in a physical space online. And that's really critical to developing a learning community. They have to feel there is a sense of group cohesion. They have to feel comfortable sharing their opinions and their ideas and engaging in open, honest communication. And I think one of the best ways to do that and just a a way to kind of operationalize it or think about it is to use that castle framework where they've identified five core competencies of social emotional learning, like five core skills. So we have self-awareness, we have self-management, relationship skills, responsible decision-making, and social awareness. And for me, I don't want SEL and social emotional learning to be an add-on. I don't want it to be something seen as separate from the work we do with students. Instead, I would love to see it integrated into our courses as a consistent daily, weekly part of our practice with learners, because those skills are what are going to help them navigate tough discussions, challenging collaborative tasks, um, that moment when they're wrestling to make meaning with a partner or with the group. And so I think there are ways, and I, I not only do I go through each of those five skills and core competencies, but like give examples of what could this look like in your classroom? How could you weave this into the fabric of the work you're doing with students? So it's just part of that community building and and helping students, quite frankly, just develop skills they need to be successful long after they leave our classrooms. Mm -hmm. So I hope it'll help teachers just giving them some concrete ideas about what these could look like in practice. Right. And and these are skills that um, sometimes they don't or we don't learn from our parents and we're learning in real time with our teachers to become better people in the world later on, like you mentioned. That's very true, very true. So um, lastly, what is your advice for teachers and education leadership to implement blended learning in schools and districts? Well, when I talk to leaders, it's slightly different. So I want leaders to have a really clear why statement. Like what is the value? What is the purpose of this shift to blended learning? Because leaders are going to encounter kind of challenges and barriers as they try to get a whole staff or a whole district or a whole school on board with the shift to blended learning, right? Because it takes time, it takes energy. Um, Neither one of those things are something that teachers have in great abundance, right? Because this work is really challenging. Um, So they have to have a really clear vision and an inspiring why statement that they can share with teachers, parents, community members, students, right? If they are really going to get people on board. I also caution leaders. I'm like, it takes time. This is not a one-year commitment. Now everybody's doing blended learning. It is a multi-year investment of time and energy and training and coaching. Um, If we're really going to help teachers who, especially those who have been in the classroom for a long time, shift practice in a way that feels sustainable and meaningful. When I talk to teachers, I'm like, think big, get excited, start small, right? Like there are multiple models. You can weave in all of these different layers of nuance with the agency and the differentiation and personalization and control over these aspects of the learning environment, but you don't have to do it all at once. Choose one model, choose one strategy, play with it. Know you're going to make a bunch of mistakes And that's okay because that's part of the learning process. And I would invite your students into that process by regularly engaging them in conversations about the work you're doing, the models you're using, um, asking for feedback about their experience because ultimately they're the customers in education and we should be asking them, how's it going? What are you liking? What are you finding challenging? How might we modify this to make the experience more enjoyable and more rewarding for you? I think That's also when we ask for that regular feedback as we're learning something new and trying something new, we very clearly communicate to students like we're in this together. I am part of this learning community and I value your experience and I want to continually make this a better class um, and learning experience for you. Like even as a graduate um, professor, Every single one of my classes in person or online ended with a feedback form. And the next class always started with me 
addressing items from the feedback form. Like, hey, this is what I thought was really interesting. This is how I'm acting on it. Because I wanted the students to know I am here to continually improve this experience for you. So those are kind of the two tiers of advice that I typically get when I'm working with leaders versus when I'm talking to teachers. Wow. Well, this is such an incredible uh, book. I am really excited um, to finish reading it because I did go into it just because I'm like, technology, that's what I do. Uh, but it, it is also um, important in the way that it is built for our ed- for our teachers, for our educators. Um, Dr. Kathleen Tucker, thank you so much for such an informative and very important conversation about um, how to embrace the new normal of hybrid teaching and enhancing a student learning. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This book is definitely another tool for your toolbox with teaching as it provides a comprehensive look at how to harness technology to give students control over their own learning pathways and then also creating connections with both new and experienced blended learning educators. You can find this book on our website, solutiontree.com. Look for the complete guide to blended learning by Catlin R. Tucker. Now for a sponsor message here by the company at Solution Tree, we share your vision to transform education to ensure learning for all. And we can help you make this vision a reality. No other professional learning company provides our unique blend of research-based results-driven services that improve learning outcomes for students. All right, we appreciate your time and for tuning in. Make sure to navigate to our solutiontree.com slash podcast page to listen to our other episodes. There you can subscribe to our podcast today. Just look for the button subscribe and find your favorite podcast app. Also, remember to like our episodes and subscribe to our Solution Tree YouTube channel. This has been your host, Prisma Lopez Marine. Thank you for joining us for Charting New Paths in Pre-K through 12 Education.